left yeah, out. Yeah, uh, no, certainly. I'm going to look at the um, network. We are online, everyone, so don't go. Yeah, yeah. 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 There was a. Uh, Did you want to be in the video? I do not want to be in the video. It's made more sense. Uh, yeah. Doesn't make for very good. Uh, yeah, come on, get me the other one. Come on, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's three o'clock. Are you ready to start, Peter? Yeah, I'm okay. ready. So uh, welcome. We're, we're happy to have Peter here uh, telling us about his research uh, this this Friday, and uh, uh, should maybe maybe we should announce like what's coming up too Is, for next Friday. Oh yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, uh, uh, take it away, Peter. Uh, Thanks. Before we start, Peter actually will be defending his PhD dissertation yes. in December. Time, yes, hopefully. The, the final defense is in December. You hope. Three defenses, I hope. We yeah. hope. <laughs> um, so this is part of his PhD, right? Yeah, so most of what I'll present here, not everything that I'll present here <laughs> is in my PhD thesis. <laughs> All right, so um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter of A. Uh, <laughs> but most of you, I think, know me. So uh, I'm going to present to you about my research on the uh, co-evolution of culture, signs, and network structure. I'm going to talk a little bit about the underlying theory, uh, my agent-based model, and some of its applications. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief outline of my uh, talk. So I'm going to talk through a little bit of the motivation that led me to uh, do this research and go over the specific research questions. Uh, and then I'm going to describe the ABM of cultural evolution that I developed in some detail. And uh, then I'm going to give uh, examples of two uh, real world applications of the model uh, or attempts at real world applications of the model. And the first one is um, has to do with political polarization. And the second one has to do uh, with scientific collaboration and then hopefully there'll be time for discussion and questions so uh, first of all when I say culture what do I mean by culture there's been many different definitions or uh, conceptualizations of the notion of culture offered in the sciences as well as the social sciences uh, but the way I see culture is from the perspective of dual inheritance theory which I will go into in a little bit of detail in just a minute but when I say culture, I really just mean the continual acquisition and transmission of shared sets of values, knowledge, and behaviors in, uh, in Asian populations or populations of individuals. And so when you think about culture, there are, there are a few big questions that immediately come to mind, and they're very natural questions to uh, ask and very easy to pose, but the answers to them are very hard. And so the first, questions, first question, such question, is why do we even have different cultural practices in different domains of life uh, in either different parts of the world or different parts of the society? Um, so for example, you can think about religions. We have many different religions and those are cultural practices. Uh, but from a purely objective or scientific point of view or from a fitness or adaptive or survival point of view, it doesn't really matter which one of those cultural practices we adopt. Uh, so from a purely survival or adaptive point of view, it doesn't matter if uh, you know, a person believes in Buddhism or Islam or Christianity. What matters, though, is the interactions of those cultural practices. So when people from different backgrounds possessing different cultural uh, traits or values come into interaction, then it begins to matter. And then whenever we're talking about culture, we also have to talk about signs. Uh, and so signs um, have some sort of meaning that is uh, attached to them, but that meaning is arbitrary. And so, so the question there is, how, do we, um, how does that meaning become attached to these uh, objects or artifacts uh, over time? Um, so you can think of the you can think of a bow tie and that can evoke um, can evoke meanings of you know f formality or sophistication so it becomes sort of a cultural symbol but there's nothing really special about that object that it would denote you know uh, a, a, a specific thing like that so the meaning is arbitrary and therefore there has to be some process by which that meaning becomes attached 
to those objects. And then finally, uh, when we think about culture, we also have to think about social networks and how they change and how they evolve um, in, our, in our society to, to look the way they actually look. And so the big idea that drove this research is, well, perhaps the answers to all of those questions could be somehow connected and there's, there's some sort of interplay going on in between cultural practices, signs, and social networks of the end of the past. Is that Esk? Yeah, that's the Czech word for dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question, good question though, yeah. Um, so, just a couple of observations. Like I said, many cultural practices, not all of them, but many of them are objectively value neutral. Uh, but their interactions are not necessarily value neutral. And that's the important thing. And then the other observation is that often it is hard for people to tell others cultural preferences. So for example, if I'm sticking with the example example of religion, if I meet a person, it, it could be potentially difficult for me to tell whether that person is religious, and if they are, then what sort of faith do they ascri uh, ascribe to. Uh, it would, could be difficult for me to tell immediately, however, that fact might be very important in our interaction. Uh, and so the question that comes to mind here is, what happens to a society on a societal level when individuals are really just left guessing or estimating others' cultural preferences or values from certain indirect clues. So uh, here's just a list of research questions, and they're kind of wordy and loaded. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm just showing the list here now, but I'm going to go through uh, each of them and um, dig deep into, into every single one of them. So the first research question really just restates what I already said is, we look at the interplay of cultural traits, observable external markers, and the social network structure of, of the um, actor population, how does that affect, in, from an evolutionary point of view, the distribution of cultural practices in, in uh, these multi-agent populations? And so I'm going to describe an ABM uh, that simulates this, uh, but first just some brief theoretical background. So the model is embedded in um, dual inheritance theory. Uh, and the central claim of that theory is that culture is uh, evolves or is transmitted by two main uh, ways. And those are vertical transmission, which is transmission from generation to generation, by means um, similar to genetic evolution. Now, that is not to say that culture is really in our genes, it's just that cultural features or practices are transmitted uh, via mechanisms that are conceptually similar to those that we find in um, genetic evolution. And the second um, mode of transmission is horizontal transmission, which is then within a single generation uh, between actors um, by means of social influence or learning. And so, Boyden, do you have a question, Andrew? I was going to ask you, are there other competing ones against Boyd and Richardson? Are there competing theories? About cultural evolution, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you could, you could say that um, Richard Dawkins, okay. the, like, memetics, that's, it's similar, right, because it also uses that evolutionary or genetic transmission language, but, but it, it, has, it has sort of a different flavor to it. Um, and then... Yeah, like neo um, neo evolutionary um, theories in anthropology are another branch of this kind of evolutionary thinking about about culture. Um, yeah, good question. Thank you. Which yeah, but it seems like the, those are important competing ones. You know, that's you know the usually it's a Cavalli Sforza. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that that's that's also some more in the in the family Feldman, of Mark Feldman. Like yeah. That also in the family of, of these evolutionary perspectives on culture. I, I think uh, the, the usual difference people talk about is that Ward and Richardson, you know, because they're anthropologists in the main, they'll, they speak about behavior a lot, and, and uh, when they'll, they'll think about you know, cultural transmission, uh, you know, weekly coupled as a, to a genetic model. But then Cavalli, Sforza, and Feldman, card-carrying geneticists, basically, have yeah. a much more, I think, uh, you know, precise mathematical View, view of how that all that works, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you, I mean, Boyd and Richardson uh, also offer pretty 
you know, pretty explicit mathematical yeah, models. Mm -hmm. uh, and More game, that, th game theoretical. Yeah, game theoretical. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of looked at their models because I couldn't find any agentized versions mm -hmm. of that. It was all it was all mathematical and basically dynamical systems. Uh, so that's you know one of the motivations why I looked at this. But yeah, yeah. and so 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 they offer they offer several um, hypothesized mechanisms that drive cultural evolution. And, and two of the most important ones, or some of the most important ones, are indirectly biased transmission, uh, which is, uh, you have the definition there, transmission of cultural trait variants driven by preferences for unrelated external markers. So that's all a little abstract, but to give you an idea, perhaps the most well-known example of that is uh, peacock tails, right? So if you um, if you think about why peacocks have those big, bushy, colorful tails, it's not because there's any biologically uh, adaptive reason for them to have it. It's, um, it was evolved through mate selection because it was selected for by the female hens. And the reason that was is because, just as in the example of, of me meeting someone um, and not knowing whether they're religious or not, the female hens did not know. They, they couldn't directly access the genotype of, of the peacocks, and they didn't know which ones had certain biologically adaptive traits or not. So they were left to uh, use external markers as models for possession of certain adaptive traits. And so that was done randomly. Certain hens looked at the tails. Other hens looked at other markers. But because presumably there was some association um, and most likely that association was random uh, between the possession of that external marker of a colorful uh, tail and some biologically adaptive trait, those hens with a preference for, for that marker, for that tail, eventually won out uh, in the long run, and that's how uh, you know, the peacock got its um, tail. Uh, and so the important part there is that there need not be any causal relationship between the possession of the external marker, the tail, and the biologically adaptive trait, or in our case, the cultural trait or cultural practice. Uh, and then guided variation is really just a fancy word for learning. So it's the, it's the um, in-life adaptation of individuals that's based on self-generated and self-explored trials, so kind of like a trial and error learning. Uh, so just to kind of reiterate a few assumptions in the model. So I assume that there's cultural traits and that they have, there's different variants of the cultural trait that are selectively neutral. And then uh, I assume the existence of external markers that are directly observable by others. And I'm gonna to refer to these from now on as tags. Uh, and they're also selectively neutral. And then there's the inability of directly inferring the possession of cultural traits by others. And I also assume an environment where uh, cooperation and coordination between agents is necessary. Uh, and finally, because we're going to be looking at the networks, uh, I also assume that social ties between agents are have to be maintained and they are costly because what they represent in the model is really a commitment to some sort of delayed reciprocal cooperation. So a social tie basically represents a commitment where uh, if someone comes up to me, asks for help, I will say, yes, I'll help you, assuming that next time I need help, you will also help me. And so that's why, uh, that's why you know, to be able to have that commitment, the two actors have to have some report built up and to build up that, build up that report, uh, they need to invest time and resources into uh, into the maintenance of those ties. So just to give you an example of how that would look like in a real world scenario, uh, let's look at the example of measuring dimensions. And so that's actually a cultural trait, I will argue, because the knowledge of how we measure uh, things is usually acquired through learning. And so there are different available trait variants, and those would be the scales or units. So we can measure things in inches or in centimeters, and they are selectively neutral because there's no inherently better way to measure dimensions. I can, you know, I can equally well measure the length of this desk in centimeters as well as in inches. 
But what matters is, say I'm working on a, a science project with my friend and we have to go off and measure different things and then compare those measurements. <laughs> Are you going to use another yeah. example here? Oh yeah. <laughs> and so then it would matter that we use the same units or that at least that we know which units we're using and that we're, we're able to communicate that to each other. And Andrew made a good point that you know that's what happened I think in the Challenger crash where they didn't know they didn't know which units they were using or some sort of yeah. NASA project yeah. where Mars probe Mars, Mars yeah no. Mars landing oh yeah it was the Mars landing probe so one team of researchers assumed not, not, it was a communication satellite that was supposed to go into orbit around Mars what didn't we finish it up into little inches and things the booster rocket. No, that was uh, not knowing that O-rings are Yeah, there was something about the temperature. Yeah. But yeah, there was a Mars probe where one set of researchers assumed the other set of researchers was using the other scale of measurements, and that led to you know losing billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. So, so it's important, right? It's important. The interactions of those cultural practices are important. Uh, so... Why, why bother with this? <laughs> why bother making a whole model about this? Well, there's, there's certainly been uh, models of cultural evolution, and there's a whole class of models that looks at it, but um, they usually, when they say evolution of culture, what they mean is specifically evolution of cooperation. So I don't really look at that. I, I assume cooperation is necessary, and I look more at coordination of cultural practices. Uh, and then there's another class of models that deals with the idea of uh, inability to infer uh, cultural traits directly and the use of tags as, as these external markers. Uh, but in, 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 in these models, usually the, there's a relationship between the tags and the trait variance that is baked in from the beginning and it's left up to the agents to kind of uh, infer or learn that relationship. Whereas what I'm trying to do is start from a clean slate where the distribute the, the tags and the, the tag population and the trait variant population is completely independent of each other in the beginning. And I try and see whether any association between them uh, emerges uh, via, uh, via evolutionary forces. <clears throat> so concerning the last bullet here, I think that there might be some stuff out there though, please. For example, so think of there's just some, so when it comes to, comes to the game players and tags, of course, David Hales did a lot of stuff, but there's, a, there's this stuff recently about, um, so it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not called network, but it basically is, is that. It's called preferential partner selection. That is, you know, you, for example, you play a game with somebody and you don't get good payoffs when you play them, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. then you don't play with them anymore. Yeah. So, so yeah. That's, it's, kind of se it's, it's kind of segregation of the players, uh, it's kind of self segregation into groups. So there, there is, there are, there, there is, there's some work, work on that. There's one woman in Arizona State who that's really her area. I can't say her name right now. Okay. So. That's, yeah, so that, that would definitely be worth looking into. But yeah, like as far as I know, I don't, because usually they play either prisoner dilemma games uh, and then there's, you know, the selection of, yeah. of players. Uh, but I haven't, yeah, I haven't come across a model that would, you know, look at coordination games. Have have the tag idea and and evolving networks. So, yeah, I don't. But I'll I'll definitely look into that. So, all right. So getting to the model, uh, I start with a random network, uh, and I place agents on node on nodes of that random network. Uh, each agent possesses a single uh, cultural trait variant and a single tag out of uh, a range of many possibilities. And then um, agents also possess preferences for, uh, for certain tags or external markers. And those are assigned randomly in the beginning. And so once we start the simulation, the agents, uh, we randomly activate the agents and they pick random neighbors uh, with whom they interact. And so the interaction is basically a coordination game where N is the number of possible trait variants. And so they compare their trait variants, and if they match, they get a boost to their fitness. If they don't match, they get a penalty to their fitness. Uh, and after a round of interaction, we let the agents modify their social networks. So based on their preferences, they either delete links to 
uh, agents possessing tags that they dislike and they create new links to random uh, agents in the network possessing uh, tags that they have a preference for. And then after a certain number of rounds, we call it a generation and we cycle the population through an EA. So I'll talk about uh, the different parts of the model in detail. Uh, and so as, as a final uh, remark here, what I basically described was one configuration, this Lamarckian configuration, because it includes both of the um, guided variation and indirect, indirect bias mechanisms. And so as controls, I also instantiated these two different configurations, one where we take away the guided variation mechanism, so agents still have preferences, but they, they're not, um, they're fixed throughout their lifetimes. And so the only way that they can change is uh, via inheritance and recombination and mutation. So that's kind of a control for the guided variation mechanism. And then finally, the unbiased configuration is one where the, the tags and the preferences for tags don't come into play at all. So that's getting rid of the indirect bias mechanism and basically the agents just interact randomly and pick, uh, delete, or create links more or less randomly. Uh, so, just to give you, uh, uh, just to kind of summarize the, the um, working of the uh, model, so I have a, a network of agents, and here the, the border of the circle represents uh, the tag that they possess, uh, and uh, the inside represents the trait variant, the cultural trait variant that they possess. And so we randomly pick an agent, so here we've picked A. And so we note that it has a preference for red and blue agents, meaning, meaning tags, the external markers. And so we randomly uh, pick one of those. So here we've picked red. And so then A will look in its neighborhood and uh, randomly pick one of its red neighbors, which in this case only has one, uh, which is B. And they interact. And so we just compare their traits. So yellow and light blue, they don't match. And because of that, they get a um, penalty to their fitness. And so after that, uh, at least in the, in the Lamarckian configuration, the agent A adjusts its preferences. And so perhaps you know, the preference for red is decreased to the point where it completely disappears from its list of preferences, in which case it would simply delete the link to any, any red neighbors as it does here. And so then when it's time uh, for it to create new links for that agent, we pick another preference, which at this point we only have a preference for blue left, uh, and it will randomly select uh, a, a subset of, of blue uh, agents in the network and create links to them. So in this case, the only other blue neighbor that it wasn't connected to before was this guy, so it creates a link. And so that's that's the basic work of the, the model. It'll mm. simplify, but yeah. I'm sorry, Peter. Could you describe that again? So the the agents look uh, in their neighborhood and identify people who are just like them, connect to them, and that's and is that the mechanism? So not not necessarily just like them. They have one. They have one yeah. So they have preferences for uh, yeah. So I guess maybe what threw you off is that this guy also has a red tag. And so he, so he interacts with the other red agent. But uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that they, have, they necessarily have preferences for people who are just like them. So this uh, agent A could have just as well had preference for, for blue and green. Okay. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe that's kind of throwing you off. Um, but it just happened to pick red in this round and so that's why it um, interacted with its red neighbor so the the personal traits of the node are not what's what's being considered when they connect to other nodes it's just their preferences so it could, yes. be, it could be a blue node and it likes red so it connects to all the reds around it yes it could be okay. it could be yeah they can't sense the inner color yeah they only sense the, the they only sense the outer color the, the outer tag color. yeah right. Yeah, that's the that's the point. At this level of abstraction, Peter, this is you know, it's actually very similar to the XRF culture model, in the case of just having something like two, having a genotype of two or something, isn't it? 
because watch this, you're going to say, you know, so the A and B have something in common, so the Axelrod model permits them to interact. Yeah, but in the Axelrod model, they, um, it's basically implied that they know the entire genotype, because the probability of them interacting is based on the, the agents. I mean, but they, they, they know the other's genotype? I mean, or they, they, they know their own? I mean, well, I don't know what no means. It's just well, we're... yeah, there's, there's, I guess, saying what they know is... I mean, I, I was going to say that in Axelrod's model, you, you, you don't get the graph structure, but one way, to, one way to basically end up with it is to say, right, do they have anything in common, yes or no? In which case, there is a link. And if there isn't, if they have nothing in common, then, then, then there's no link. Right? So, there's, so there's an implied graph structure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then, and then see, then these guys in, in Spain, Maxi, San Miguel, and those guys, then they did it with a with long, long distance interaction permitted. Yeah, yeah. But I still think this is different because in, in, the, in the actual art model, basically what you have is are, are the traits, mm -hmm. and the length of that genotype could be you know, could whatever, be longer, right. could be longer. Uh, and the probability of interaction of two agents just de depends on the overlap in their genotype. Right, I'm, I'm, but but here, if, but you it, if, you, if you use the actual model to do it with two, though, with, with yeah, you know, type like two, it isn't uh, isn't now you you are the two models overlapping? Well, it's not entirely equivalent because they only take into account wh when they decide on the interaction on right. whom to interact with. They only take into account the external right. the external tag. They don't take into account the Understood. the inner trade at all. Mm -hmm. The inner trait only comes into play once once they have paired up, and then they play the coordination game right. on the inner trait. But are you sure that nobody? Uh, so right, so it's not the, the straight X web model. But are you sure, there's nobody who's done a variation like that. Like they've done a variation with like you know, uh, with you know, preferred tag or something, or with. Well, yeah, like like Hales did tags, yeah. or or then Hammond and Axelrod in a later paper. Well, the main thing tags. is that, it turns out that the main people who have seized on that Axelrod model were these guys who did the particle. What, what, Jim Kennedy, like you know those guys who did the particle swarm optimization. Yeah. So guys, yeah. Right? And so they have it. They they, they reduce it to a very simple, to a more simpler structure. So I, I'm just it just struck me that at the level of which you described it, it struck me as being. Almost, almost, almost similar. Almost exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, yeah. It's true. There's a lot of models that are very similar, but. Right. For example, I guess um, they, 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 you, you have the network. The network could you can interpret the network in Axelrod sense as just being you either are for example you have you break the link when you have nothing in common. Yeah. Right. So, but in Axelrod, it was still on a grid. So even though there was some sort of you know probability yeah, based on. That's it. I said the, 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 the yeah, same the guys did it for far did it for long range interaction. Yes, yes, but um, I mean, here the network could be anything, right? And then, and then, you start with a random network, but based on the adjustments of the that the agents do themselves, it there there's really no limits to what the network ends up looking in the end. Yeah. I'm sorry, if, I'm, if you want me to wait till the end, I can. But I'm still struggling with. So why can't I consider the the outside the preference? Mm -hmm. Why is that not considered? Why can't I do the same thing? From a matrix point of view, wouldn't that just be another attribute? It's I'm not sure I'm understanding the, so, the question. Um, the, uh, there is the internal kind of the, the trait of the individual. Yes, yes. That is the node. And then their preferences for who they want to connect to, correct? Yeah. And the preferences relate to the external markers, because that's the only thing that they can observe. The, the external markers, right. But, yeah. But that's just another attribute. Yes, right? yes, I mean, yes. That, that's, so, yeah, you're correct. So is it... This is just, uh, isn't this just um, a, a linear kind of, so far, I mean, I know there's a genetic algorithm, so this is just a, a linear kind of network growth model where you've got two attributes instead of one? Well, it's not a, it's not a growth model. It's just a linear model with just two attributes, not, not a growth model. The attributes are different. One is observable and one is not. In a, in a two-step process, one, make a link, and two, interact. So on the make a link, it's only one of the preference, one of the traits, attributes that is involved, and then when they interact, the other attribute, yeah, or another set of attributes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill is explaining it. Okay. Well.
<laughs> Thank you. I got it from you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but we get we can talk afterwards if, if it's still not entirely clear. Uh, but you also were okay there. from the Axel Rod model, right? For jazz. That was a different Axel Rod model. That was not the culture model. That was the norms game. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, yeah. So that's the interaction part, and then I guess just a quick note on how the preferences are actually calculated and adjusted in the agent. So I, I use the ActR uh, modeling framework, which is a um, it's 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 established and perhaps the most influential cognitive modeling architecture. Uh, not if you agree, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, so the math is not important right now, but maybe focus your attention to the um, to the figure over here, where um, on the y-axis is what they call in ACTAR base level activation, which is basically the ability to recall a chunk of information, uh, or in this case, the ability to attach some sort of preference to a specific tag over time. And so you see here. Um, spikes followed with uh, episodes of decay and so what happens here at these spikes is some sort of uh, positive experience with that specific uh, tag so if they played a game with a red agent and they were able to um, successfully interact with a red agent then their preference for the red tag will spike and then and and during times where there there's nothing happening um, there's um, a gradual decay until they have another experience, a positive experience with that tag, and uh, its, its preference shoots up again. And so then there's some sort of threshold where, threshold value when once it dips below that threshold value, that um, preference for that tag will disappear. So that's basically adopting the actor memory model to the preferences of the agents. So once they play a certain number of rounds. Uh, we call it generation and feed it into an evolutionary algorithm. So we evaluate the agents according to their fitness. We select some sort of subset of the fittest agents. They become the parents and we recombine them to create offspring, mutate the offspring and reinsert into the population. So particularly in this case, I use a generational EA, meaning that I replace the population at once uh, all at once and so I create one offspring per node uh, and so we look at each node in the network and um, we select two parents for each node uh, and I do that by looking at the current occupant of the node and its immediate neighbors uh, assuming that they have some sort of cultural influence on that location uh, and from that subset I, I select two parents via tournament selections and once I have the parents, I just perform cross uniform crossover on them, add mutations to the newly uh, created offspring, and, and place it on that node. And so we do that node by node on the social network. <coughs> and what is the measure of fitness at this point? Do you know? So it's their ability um, to successfully interact. So uh, basically, their score from those coordination games based on matching their trait variants. So, th so the central assumption that's baked into the model is uh, it's, it's desirable for you to, uh, to align your cultural practices with others. Uh, going back to you know, like the example of measuring those dimensions, because if, if, you don't, uh, if one of us measures things in inches and Andrew measures things in centimeters, our Mars probe is going to explode. But it's, instead of having being discrete, like it, it isn't the case that this, this fitness actually is continuous. So you're going to be, you know, if, I, if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I have two neighbors who I'm partially aligned with, that's as good as having one neighbor that I'm fully aligned to. It isn't, isn't that? Well, so for now, the traits are categorical. So okay. there's 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 no scale. So, so for now, it doesn't. You we can't really say you know I'm partially aligned with someone. Okay. Either I am or I'm not. Um, so to go back to your figure there, so, okay, so that, that's not clear to me. So when you drew that, when you drew that on, on the final that? figure with the, with the network, yeah, on the final fi on the final figure that that one. So when you drew the link from A to the extreme one on the left, uh -huh. uh, so they, they have they have no colors in common. Yeah, 
Has Correct. Yeah. Right. It, it it just so it, it just uh, created that link based on its preference. Right. Uh, and so it just happened. Either it just happened to have a preference for blue, or it has a preference for blue because it has interacted with this guy before. So, so where am and I here know? they that's you so know. What I want to know is the fitness determination. So did that establishing that link that it had to A's fitness? Uh, so not immediately. Not immediately. Uh, there's, like I said, there's a there's a maintenance cost to having mm, to keeping up social ties, which is which is added um, at the end of each round. So, for example, this guy only has one link, so it only pays one maintenance cost per round in terms of fitness. Uh, whereas this guy now has four links, so it pays you know four times the maintenance cost. In terms, in terms of fitness, it would be useful to know how yeah, so how, right, how the fitness is calculated, I guess, to, to see. You know, we're gonna list, it's not obvious to me what the fit, what the fitness of A is here. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess that's a, well. So I guess that's a good point because and also get, and then given the weighting, also you, given that decay in the actor, in the, in the actor scheme, there, it's not clear to me how that fits into the fitness function. But we're gonna find it. What if, what, if, what, if, what if my preference is decaying? I establish a link with it, my preference is decaying. Does that mean, mean I have, it's, if I progress with less fitness with that link that I established? So, no, no, no. So, so, the, so the, the preferences do not directly affect fitness at all. I mean, they. Well, they, no, but it, but it affects it through I, the fact that A establishes a link to the guy on the left is establishing as well. Well, yeah, so that, that would be an, in, I would call that an indirect influence uh, on okay. fitness or indirect effect on fitness. But, uh, but the actual creation of that link or deletion of a link doesn't, uh, doesn't affect the fitness right, uh, up the until the point where we apply the maintenance costs. Uh, so, yeah, I guess you could say it does. So, 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 me question is going to be, at this instant right now, A is a certain fitness. In the next click of the clock, it establishes the link to the left, to the left, to the next. Yes. Oops. The wrong direction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There. And now, A, you're saying A's fitness has not changed yet. So, it depends on how you look at it in the model. Oh, okay. So, in the model, the maintenance costs are applied at the very end of each round. But from a from you know from like as a from an epistemological view, you can you can basically say that you know its fitness has decreased because it has now more links to keep up. It has decreased. Okay, so there's no, there's no advantage to being having the other having an extra link. Well, there could be. Know. There could be because. And wh when is that determined? So that's determined during during all of these interactions, right? So. So here they did not match in their trait variance, and that's so their fitnesses were decreased. Uh -huh. But say say that in the next round, yeah. these two interact. Well, these two have the same trait variant, and therefore their in, their um, their fitness would increase by an equal amount here. Um, okay, so in that case, now now that the question, though, now, I just just, just, I'm just understand what's what's yeah, going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, time to, maybe maybe you should have some pseudocodes so we can just see if. For example, so uh, is it the case then that during one click of the clock, every agent is looking only at one edge, or every agent looks at all of its edges to evaluate to, to get this, we see to establish the, what I'm going to call the payoffs here? Uh, yeah, so it, it, it selects one edge. It selects right. one edge and performs one interaction event. Okay, so go forward now to where A hooks onto the leftmost one. And is, is, is it the case then that I mentioned that A picked the leftmost one to interact with? It actually would derive no benefit from that because they they don't have the they don't have the uh, correct in common, yeah right? correct so that's only paying the maintenance cost for now yes yeah 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 yeah, um, yeah. Okay. so actually this is yeah this is not a good choice for A to make right um, but it doesn't know that it doesn't right. know that <laughs> right yeah. and then is it the case also when it just it's just not barbashi like now is it the case in that for then for a node with many edges. If it, if it only only picks one of them, right? Mm -hmm. Then in fact, um, so it's in, in essence, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's I guess what about it? Is there a version of the model where instead of picking, you know, having every agent pick one, you would for example have every agent pick like you know 
twenty percent of its engine is loaded. So you mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. are there, are there, are you going to tell us about that? But who's gonna yeah, um, no, actually, I haven't. I haven't thought about that, uh, okay. or I haven't, you know, explored it. Even though I have thought about it, um, yeah, it's it would be interesting to see whether you know doing it serially or doing it in parallel to yeah. some extent makes a difference. I, I don't know the answer to that question right yeah, now. So, so you, 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 you picked the one, you picked it just for simplicity, I suppose? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you're just teaching not the right area of verbal work, based on what's coming <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, um, right, so, so I have the, um, I have the Asian-based model, and now I, uh, I, I perform a partial parameter sweep uh, looking at some important uh, parameters and um, I, I'm, I'm after, you know, I want to observe what happens to distributions of the trait variance in the population as well as the distribution of tags. Um, so I have different measures for that and I also want to look at the network structure itself how the agents connect to each other. So looking at things like clustering coefficients and path lengths. So now I'm gonna show you two slides where the first slide is not that interesting, but the second slide, I, at least I like to think, is pretty interesting. So this <laughs> is the network uh, on the left after five generations and on the right after 100 generations in the unbiased configuration of the model. So that's the one where they pretty much you know, act more or less randomly. And so you see in the beginning, there's not a lot of uh, connections going on. It's a pretty sparse network. But after 100 generations, it all becomes this one, um, this one dense uh, convoluted blob. And if you look closely on the inside, they, they all have the same trait variant. So it actually, so one single trait variant took over the entire population. So since you have, since it's 100 generations, we're trying to figure out whether 100 is long or short here. And I don't, I, you probably told in the previous table how big the population was, but I forget what it was already. But yeah, the, it was it was a thousand agents. But so, it, so, it, it, so I think the unbiased case is kind of neutral evolution in the in the Borden Richardson. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Is, isn't it a theorem in Cavalli, Sforza, and Feldman that if you wait long enough, you will you will get the takeover. You always get to yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. have to. Right? You can yeah, and so 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 yeah, it, that's why I have the unbiased configuration the, there. It's kind of a control. Okay. Uh, as opposed to the the bias so configuration. Of, how, how long would it take to get to really get to monochronicity over here? Is it going to be a thousand or ten thousand, or have you ever, um, ever observed it or not? So you mean in the tags? Because I, I'm already observing uh, takeover in the in the trait variance. Right. Um, like what, what is it? Is, 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 is it it's Nakamura or something? Or it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a Japanese name, right? Because it, it pr first proved the fact that if you have a finite any finite pot set of traits, if the stochastic variation is going to always hit one of the walls, yeah. that's 100% right. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's, yeah, I, that's a ma mathematical certainty. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, so we actually see that here in the unbiased configuration. And so now what happens in the, in the Lamarckian configuration where we have both of the mechanisms involved? Uh, so after five generations, we see pretty much the same picture. But after 100 generations, we see the, this. Uh, clustered network where the, pro the the agents cluster in these communities that are distinct in in that they um, the agents in the communities possess uh, a specific trait variant they share a specific trait variant and a specific uh, tag and so of course there are exceptions but overall uh, that is the case and what's what's uh, interesting about this is that now more or less each tag corresponds or is associated with the possession of a certain trait variant so in that sense we might say that uh, the tag can function now as a sign as a cultural sign of uh, possession of of specific trait variants what would it be a real, but, real world example so so a real world example of that would be like certain types of clothing so if someone's wearing a yarmulke, uh, the you know my immediate idea is you know they're they're, they're Jewish, uh, so that could be that could be an example of that, um, and and you know, it, so it might not be a hundred percent, and that might be a hundred percent association. I might be wrong in, in my assumption, but so are you are you happy to just call these things groups in some sense? Are they called cultural groups? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's what I would like to call them. Uh, 
and so isn't the case that so when David Hales first put tags on his agents, he also talked about the spontaneous formation of groups. But is it the case that his are less less variegated? Or you would have this two dimensional character? Is that the you know, the, the external signal and the internal structure? Is that, yeah. Is so he he well, if, if if I'm not mistaken, he had the he had kind of a baked in relationship between the tags and the uh, and the trait variants, and it was just up to the agents to kind of learn that relationship. So that, you know there were there were errors in the beginning. But after time, they, they kind of learned which agents possess which tags, and they knew that those agents would possess those trait variants. But here, here the difference is that I, I start with completely yeah. independent distributions. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, looking at nice pictures of networks doesn't make good science. So we look at quantitative analyses too. So here it shows heat maps with respect to um, a couple of parameters: the maintenance cost per link and the number of rounds per uh, generation. And so in the left column, uh, you see the unbiased configurations, middle column is the genetic configuration, and the right column is the Lamarckian. And the top row looks at the clustering coefficients at the end of uh, 100 generations, which was my, my, the length of my simulation. Uh, and uh, on the bottom, we see path lengths. And so you see that. Um, pretty much across the board, regardless of position in this particular parameter space, we see that the Lamarckian configurations have significantly higher uh, clustering coefficients than the other two, and substantially lower path lengths than the other two. Now, what does this mean? It, it, it basically means that they are more small world-like than the others, because um, the way we can identify small worldness is by looking at uh, looking at their clustering coefficients, which should be uh, sig should be significantly higher than compared to regular lattices on uh, on the same deg uh, degree distribution networks, and the path length should be shorter than regular lattice. And this is actually uh, not the absolute measures, but compared to regular lattices. So. Um, so, so they're more small world-like, and they're also more modular. So here on the top, we see modularity of the networks in terms of tags and uh, in terms of traits on the bottom. And so you see that both of the, the uh, bias configurations have higher uh, uh, modularity. Again, it's you know, regardless of position in the uh, parameter space, although here that's not the case, and, and it's, it's only in that... Uh, uh, in that low cost, low maintenance cost regime. Uh, so, so um, the mechanisms of indirect bias and guided variation create uh, small world networks and modular networks in terms of trait variants and tags, which is what we would perhaps expe expect to see in real world scenarios. And so, why why is that? Um, I I think, I believe it's uh, a combination of drift effects and kin selection and their, uh, their relative importance in, those, in, in the different configurations. But it's something that I haven't explored so far, and so that's uh, potential for future work. I don't, how are we doing on time? I just want to make sure that I'm... If you said oh. 10 minutes, would you go? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the one of the applications at least which I find the more interesting one which is so I wanted to see if I can apply my cultural model at, on a real-world scenario and so here I ask can I apply to reproduce the dynamics of bill co-sponsorship in the US House of Representatives uh, why bill co-sponsorship It's because really what I'm after is political polarization so uh, there's an increasing sense that our society is becoming politically polarized, which was you know, supported by a number of studies, and there have been different um, hypothesized drivers of, of that polarization. And so because polarization is, to a certain extent, a cultural phenomenon, I, I think that a cultural explanation uh, via a cultural model is, uh, is, is due. And so why use Bill Cons co-sponsorship. Uh, so if you want to look at political polarization in, in 
you know, the el political elites uh, in our country. It's a good place to start because co-sponsorship is a, the daily bread, basically, of legislators. Uh, it's viewed as a low-cost opportunity for them to signal their ideological position to their constituency. And there's been, uh, there's been research that shows that uh, constituents actually hold beliefs about the ideological positions of their representatives and that they hold, um, they hold them responsible based on those beliefs uh, when, you know, come election time. And so, so it's important for uh, these legislators to signal uh, their intentions through bill co-sponsorship. And so because that co-sponsoring relationship uh, between two legislators or, or multiple legislators can be thought of as a social network, we can once again look at the social networks and, and uh, see how they evolve and if we see any measures of polarization emerging. So, so we need to modify the, net, the, yeah, the, the model here, and this is kind of getting at, at what you were saying before, Rob, is that before we were um, assuming, or I was assuming categorical traits. And so now, if the cultural trait here is political ideology, we are used to uh, measuring ideology on a scale, so on a left-right scale. Uh, and you can get fancier with two-dimensional scales, but I just keep it easy with a one-dimensional scale. And so uh, you have a conservative liberal scale, and so you would assume that the, the, the Republicans would be on the conservative side and the Democrats would be on the liberal side, although there is probably some overlap in the middle. Um, so you have distributions uh, by a party. And so, because now we have ordinal traits, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to say, you know, what, what's, what's a matching, what, what's a match uh, in those traits. So I add uh, another attribute, which I um, initialized randomly in the beginning for the agents, which is a tolerance attribute. And so what that does is based on uh, the position of the agent in, on the ideological scale, it has some sort of tolerance with the, which defines this interval uh, of views that it's able to tolerate when it interacts with others. And so if, they're, uh, if they overlap, this, this is wrong. It should actually, this should be all the way around the agent. So if, if, each, if they interact and their ideological positions fall into each other's intervals of tolerance, they, that interaction is considered a success, meaning that they can work out a compromise or they're able to tolerate their views uh, in that interaction. And so that the interaction here is a co-sponsoring one, where one of the legislators co-sponsors the other's bill. Um, and so... In your final presentation, you should, but the left, uh, blue should be left and red should be right, I suppose. <laughs> Well, it was a, there's a guy at Santa Fe who's just so blue. Oh yeah, that's true. Well, I, I just <laughs> <laughs> the guy at Santa Fe. Uh, you guys, you, maybe some guys have been down there. Met Simon Dedeo tells me that he they, they've discovered the origin of that terminology in the documents of the French Revolution or something. Or, uh, and they they've done this. They basically, they've taken all the documents from the French Revolution and they put them through uh, various. Oh, the left uh, right. And the, what left right falls out of that. So I, I, was, I, I, was, I, I think I think it was because yeah, in the French Revolution, like the. The socialist representative would sit on the actual left, left side of the of the oh, house. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and the blue therefore being blue blood. Is that right? I don't know. Well, <laughs> probably the reverse. No. Right? Yeah. Well, it's different in Europe, right? The 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 no, no, the, uh, yeah, the colors are opposite no, in Europe, true. right? <laughs> so. The red are the socialist. So yes. just just to uh, kind of get to the uh, bottom of this here. So I, I measure polarization in two ways. One is the average tolerance that's present in the population based on their tolerance attributes, which, can, which, uh, which, which are dynamic through, through, um, through the, uh, the process of, of inheritance. And so what the evolutionary algorithm here is kind of a metaphor, right? Because it's not like legislators have baby legislators and they are then in, in the House of Representatives, but it, it's a metaphor for um, either social influence where uh, new legislators acquire, um, acquire the practices and traits of, of older legislators or 
you know, if, if old legislators get reelected, them acquiring um, via social influence new, uh, new positions. And the other one, uh, the other measure is the uh, I, uh, average ideological distance uh, in, in the body of the representatives. And so I use uh, the data set of bill co-sponsorship, uh, which stretches from 1973 to 2008. So we have a record of every bill that has been ever proposed and the sponsors and all the co-sponsors and the information on the representatives, their party affiliation, et cetera. And so we can, we can use this um, data to calibrate uh, many of the parameters in the model. Uh, and then for the rest, uh, I, can, I do a, a sensitivity analysis. And so here we see some networks. I hope that it's somewhat visible to you. Um, so, so A here represents the actual empirical uh, co-sponsorship network uh, between legislators of the two parties. I believe this is for 2008, uh, and which is the latest period that uh, I've used the data for. B is the one that was um, simulated by the, by the cultural evolution model. And then in the same vein as before, I have a couple of uh, alternative models that I use as control um, as, as benchmarks for, for the performance of, of the cultural evolution model. Uh, and so, so I can then compare um, the networks that were created in the simulations to the actual empirical networks. And so here are the empirical data. So I look at things like average degree, clustering coefficients, again, modularity in terms of party uh, path lengths. And I can compare the data, which is the red line here, to the models that I simulate. And so some of them uh, perform pretty well, some of them not so much. And so here the, the purple one is what I hear called the party-based model, but that's the that's the cultural evolution model that I have taken, modified, and applied to it. And so it performs pretty well. Uh, and, but this is, of course, just one uh, parameter configuration. So then you have to look at it um, in terms of, you, know, you have to compile and look at the distribution of the error uh, res with respect to the data uh, across the entire search space. And so actually, uh, the the party based model uh, performs uh, better than, than than the alternative models in in, in most cases. Um, so so then what if I if we simulate the party based model and look at it, what do we see in terms of um, in terms of polarization? So looking at these heat maps again, uh, in terms of parameters of the maintenance cause, and lambda here is the rate at which they are allowed to adjust their um, uh, adjust their social ties in the network um, and so on the left you see average tolerance and this is at the end of the simulation so after 15 electoral periods and on the right you see uh, the average ideological pairwise distance um, and so you see some sort of uh, variability based on the position in the search space but uh, what is important is if you look at the ranges, uh, you see that um, you see that the average tolerance at the end is is lower than what we would expect in, in a random uh, population, right? Because if you have if you have a scale that has um, that has uh, ten points, then your your uh, uniform distribution of um, of tolerance should have a value of 4.5, right? Because the, the highest tolerance you can have is nine. Uh, and so in, in all of these cases, it ends up being lower than that. Uh, so you have, you have a lower than expected uh, tolerance in your population. But on the other hand, you have a higher than expect, okay, so <laughs> lower than expected ideological distance, or you could look at it in terms of higher than expected ideological proximity, which is, to me, it was surprising because it's not really what I expected. Uh, because when we think of increasing polarization, we think of increasing uh, ideological distance, which is not what is happening here. You have high ideological proximity, but low tolerance. So the model, the model would imply that um, that in this case we see 
increasing political polarization in one aspect, decreasing to uh, tolerance, but uh, actually decreasing political polarization in another aspect. The, uh, so the agents are becoming closer in terms of their views, but they're becoming less tolerant of those views. Uh, and so that's you know food for thought, uh, where you know perhaps we can we can look at it that way when we look at the actual networks. Um, so I just want to finish up here. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So so that was um, the political polarization aspect of it, and uh, then I also looked at scientific collaboration, and I and um, I. Um, wanted to apply the, the uh, cultural model to uh, co-authorship networks and the dynamics of scientific collaboration. So um, this has been studied from many perspectives, notably also from a network science perspective. Um, but the focus um, in, in most of those network science studies was on cumulative um, graphs of co-authorship uh, so uh, if you're familiar with the Barabazi study, they kind of looked at the cumulative co-authorship uh, graph and they created, they, they um, applied their preferential attachment model to explain the growth in that, um, in that network. But it, that, that it's not really a sociological explanation. The preferential attachment model is, is it's more of a physical model. And so I would argue that um, the issue of scientific collaboration is, is a social one. Uh, it has social drivers as well as cultural, but also it's driven by the network structure. Um, and so I look at co-authorship networks as constantly evolving structures, once again. And uh, so I use uh, a data set, um, the Microsoft Academic Graph, which has, it, it's, it's the most comprehensive data set of its kind regarding um, regarding authorship in, in uh, scientific uh, journals or scientific publications in general. And so for the purposes of the model, I assume that researchers possess certain cultural traits that are uh, pertinent to scientific collaboration, such as you know their research practices and so on, but also external markers like institutional affiliation, their rank, their publication record, and so on. And that they use this to uh, to to um, select collaboration pathways, and so here here uh, the the big modification uh, to the ABM is that where I have previously had fixed populations here I need to adjust for for uh, modeling growing populations because if you look at a certain discipline you begin with maybe just a few uh, authors that are active in the discipline. And as it becomes more popular, uh, more and more people come in and start publishing. And so you have a growing population like that. But since I have the data, I can look at it. And, and from the data, I can estimate um, growth rates for the population, which, on, which I then uh, use in the model. So that was estimated from the data, among other things. And so I. I, um, I looked at two specific fields. Um, I looked at economics and artificial intelligence, just to have a comparison. The reason why I chose these two is because I wanted them to be, to be different enough. So where economics is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but consider a social science, and artificial intelligence is, a, is part of computer science or a, a STEM field. So they're significantly different, and they both are well established enough that, that the publication record would be substantial enough. Uh, but apart from that, they, I, I basically just chose them at random, apart from those two criteria. And so, uh, so I can look at the, I can look at these time slices of co-authorship co networks in the, uh, in the different disciplines based on the data. So this is taken from the data, and this is just the time slice for these years. Uh, so it's not the complete network, it's just the time slice. Uh, and you see the co-authorship network. And so then you can arrange these time slices from whenever it was year one for that discipline all the way up to the present point, and then we can do the same with the simulated networks. 
and then compare the slices over time and see uh, what sort of fit we get or, um, uh, yeah. So just tell us more about the graph here. So that when, the, when there are no edges present, that means there's no linkage at all. So at least it, this is not something like where you plotted just 1% of the edges or something, right? Yeah, so uh, I guess I hope you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, but there, there you can see some of the edges on the inside here. Right. Yeah. And so I guess this is just an artifact of the layout that I used. But like if you see these groupings, that's that's probably a single paper by, you know, six authors here. And so 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 they would have a co-authorship relationship because in that time span they published one paper. And and it's a that subgraph is just a complete graph. But it means because there, I don't see any edges from it then so None of those authors had any other papers, had any other co authors during that time period. During that time period, yeah, yeah. And so these single nodes would just be single author papers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah sorry if you can't see the edges that well on there on the middle. But so that's the empirical data, and then we can comp I compare it to the simulated networks. And I, I once again, I can do these analyses based on different. Um, network statistics and so on the top there you see the economics um, case and on the bottom you see the artificial intelligence case and once again I compare it to a sort of a random model which is actually the left bar on there because this social weight uh, parameter doesn't really make sense in the random model so it's just a bar in terms of the cost parameter but two things to notice here um, very different results in both cases. So in the economics case, there's actual actual regions of the parameter space where there's there's a, there's a good fit with the data. It's not really the case with the artificial intelligence um, one. And on top of it, if you compare it to the random model, the random model actually does better in the artificial intelligence literature than than my cultural model. Uh, whereas there are certain <laughs> there are certain <laughs> regions of the parameter space where the culture model overperforms the random model and, and shows a, a good fit with the data, so that could mean that there are potentially different cultures in different academic fields. That uh, the way that authors in the disciplines of artificial intelligence forge collaborations is substantially different from the way that economic, economists do it. Um, yes? Was your data journal articles or conference papers? Yes, that's a good point because um, I, fields. Yes, yes, I limited it to journal articles. And so as you would probably point out at this point is that um, artificial intelligence being computer science people, they give much more weight to conference articles. And so that's precisely the type of thing that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a different culture, right? So computer science people have a culture where, where conference articles are more important than journal articles, which is not the culture in the rest of the field. So that could be one reason why we see a, a bad fit for, for the model in, in the AI. But that's yeah, so that's the, that's the takeaway from, from that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I, I uh, developed an ABM cultural evolution, and then I applied it to these two, um, these two case studies. Um, and uh, I appreciate it. There are any further questions or comments? Thanks. Thank you. You mentioned that the, there are two mechanisms of cultural transfer. Yeah. What are the implications, or what are the implications of these two different uh, cultural transfers? So one was inheritance from one generation vertical, and one yeah. horizontal. Yeah. So well, yes, and then there were the specific mechanisms of indirect bias <laughs> and, and learning, but. Uh, I guess the um, the implication of that is, if, if if you are to if you are to believe what the model says, then what that says about about uh, our culture is that we we really do 
you know, judge people. We judge the book by its cover. Um, but, you know, is, is that a lot of times that's out of necessity because, you know, I, when I was giving the examples, it's, it's a lot of times it's just hard or expensive to understand the other person and where they are coming from culturally. And so we make these snap heuristics based on, you know, um, judging the book by its cover, so to speak. Actually, there are so many books. We visit a bookstore, you see, oh, there's so many of them, you know, which one, you know, to pick. Actually, covers are important, at least, to, <laughs> you know, attract your attention in the first place, even to take a look yeah, at them. Yeah, yeah. There are so many of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th there, there's a, yeah, there's a good reason why we would use that heuristic, yeah. because it's Every cheap. Every time I visit a yeah. bookstore, I'm thinking, it would be a good thing to study, actually, how people actually pick, you know, the cover, which book <laughs> to, to pick, you know, to look at. <laughs> Can we go offline? No, but I have a. Do you want question. something off the record? Or? Yeah, let me. Let me. I'm gonna take us offline. <laughs>